Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our weekend Cabral House Calls. Looking forward to answering your questions like we do each and every weekend, getting about a dozen questions in. Yesterday, we answered genetic questions, detox questions, headache questions, nighttime urination questions, all sorts of great health, wellness, weight loss uh, answers over on episode 1737. Today will be episode 1738. If you want to read along with today's questions, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1738. Excited to get started. Excited to answer our community's questions like we do each and every weekend. So without further ado, let's dive right into the show. All right. We're again on the phone here today answering the questions, uh, giving that giving that iPad a little bit of a rest this week. So first question is coming in actually from Matt. Matt is asking, hello, Dr. Rawl. Thank you for all the information you make available for free. For the past decade, I've had dry patches on my skin, on my eyelids, on my eyelids or arms during the winter. Usually this clears up by the spring. This year it did not, and it only got worse during the summer, leading to general allergy diagnosis and then eczema. After two rounds of topical and oral steroids, I decided to try to f- the root cause, try to find the root cause and an actual cure rather than treating the symptoms. I tried a uh, rudimentary food elimination plan, Whole30, but didn't see any improvement. Actually, just a further outbreak. My friend referred me to your podcast, and I just completed the Parasite Protocol, and I'm on day five of the CBO Protocol now. I've cut out all the histamine foods on the list, as well as listened to one of your other podcasts on skin issues. I've been taking Claritin for the past seven years due to being allergic to our dog and dust and dander. We no longer have our pup, but I continue to take Claritin. I've listened to the seven, the three podcasts that you mentioned Claritin, but I did not hear anything specific to Claritin itself. If you were in my shoes, would you stop taking Claritin? I'm reading the rain barrel effect and wondering if it is contributing to my rain barrel. Thank you. All right. So just a disclaimer, as we always have to do, there's no treatment protocols provided on the show or any shows. There is no cures provided on the show, and we don't do diagnosis, right? So that's against FDA rules. What we do is we look for the underlying root causes, under underlying root balance imbalances, holding you back from achieving your wellness goals. Remember, you didn't get here by accident. There's always a reason why. You just haven't found that reason quite yet. So I can't tell you to come off medication or tell you to stay on it. That's not how this works. What I can tell you, though, and and I really need you to go deeper on the podcast, right? Because you've listened to a couple shows, which is great. Once you read The Rain Barrel Effect, you'll know so much more. We really will. Because you'll understand that you're on an antihistamine, and the way that those work are offering, pushing you more into that sympathetic nervous system, depleting your body of more zinc, depleting your body of more magnesium, uh, potentially affecting your sleep, potentially causing uh, leaky gut or intestinal-based permeability, which is allowing more proteins to seep in your bloodstream, which is causing more of an immune reaction, which is now leading to allergies, potentially asthma in the future, potentially headaches and migraines like our friend Sydney yesterday, and also uh, leading to skin issues. So that's part of the whole issue, right? So I'm glad to see that you did the Parasite Protocol. Very happy to see that you're doing the CBO Protocol. Would love for you to do the CBO Finisher after that, but we need to make sure that we continue to work on the gut, that we're calming, uh, that we're emptying the rain barrel of those high histamine foods for now, and that we're allowing you to produce more of your own diamine oxidase, which is your own natural antihistamine enzyme, which is produced in your gut that isn't going to really be produced to the level that you need it until you heal and seal that gut. So kind of a long answer to say you're on the right track, Matt. Keep doing your research. Keep working the protocols. Read the rain barrel effect. And uh, remember, the medications are never the answer. I'm not telling you to come off it, but they're never the answer. Now, they could be a good temporary palliative solution to calm your symptoms. I had to do it for many years, right? Way back in the day, I was on all sorts of medications, didn't know how to get well, continued to work the protocols, continued to get a little bit better and a little bit better, and then none of the medications were needed. I mean, you're talking to somebody who used to wake up and take Sudafed every day and take Benadryl every night, right? I mean, that was my life, of course, with a whole lot of other uh, medications like Prilosec and Cortef and Florinef and, you know, all sorts of things. But Matt, you're getting there. There's no doubt about it. Keep working that path. All right, Megan's up next. Dr. Brawl, I wanted to say thank you for all that you do. You are such an inspiring mentor in creating real change and giving us all hope, which is invaluable. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. I really do appreciate all of your kind words that you write in. Uh, it, it means a lot to me. I kind of glaze over them, but it means a lot to me. My question today is around grains and inflammation. I understand that grains can be inflammatory. However, I would like to better understand why. 
When I eat grains in consecutive days, I get arthritic pain in my right shoulder, and within a few days of going off grains, it goes away. I have recently finished the CBO protocol and currently on the Heal and Sale protocol, but would like to know how I can get my body to a point where I can tolerate grains without inflammation. Why does this happen? Thank you. It's a great question, Megan. And um, again, I had the same issue. Uh, my gut was not in good shape. I had candida overgrowth. I had SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and I had clostridium. Div- I had sorry, I had um, H. pylori, and so. So I had to rebuild my gut. My gut was massively inflamed. And when your gut's massively inflamed, even though some grains can actually be very healthy for you, like a quinoa or an oatmeal, et cetera, obviously uh, some of the longest lived world populations of the world ate rice. Um, the issue is that sometimes the lectins or uh, even high fiber or the husks on the outside of the grain the little shells on the outside. That's why it's sometimes not just grains. Sometimes people who can't eat grains can't eat beans either. And it's the, it's essentially that outer layer of a lot of plant-based foods, which is a protective layer to the plant, aggravates the digestive tract when it's not healthy, when it's not in a good place. But, you know, it's kind of like if you say grains are unhealthy, well, then you can make a case for pretty much everything. Like, Saturated fat can be inflammatory and cause higher levels of, uh, you know, lipopolysaccharides. Um, you, I mean, again, like I can make a case for honestly everything. So there is a bit of bioindividuality. Um, I don't eat a lot of grains in my diet. I really don't. I eat a little bit of oatmeal and I eat some rice. That is about it that I eat for grains. I don't eat millet. I don't eat quinoa. I don't eat amaranth. Uh, I don't do a lot of beans in my diet. Uh, but I eat those and, and it works for me and I don't necessarily need to eat them as much, but I, I do fine with them. And again, like if I have wheat, it's no big deal anymore. Like I have no issues with gluten anymore. Again, will it build up and be inflammatory? Sure. But like, I don't make a habit of eating those every day. So what I would say is you can heal your gut just like I did. You can go through the parasite protocol, the CBO protocol, the mold protocol, the CBO finisher, whatever you need. And again, you can find out what's going on with your gut by running the candida metabolic and vitamins test, uh, as well as the uh, bacteria and parasite stool test. And there's one more. It's the IgG food sensitivity test. You can run all of these at home. Now, remember, an IgG food sensitivity test is not meant to look at lectins and oxalates and other things like that, right? It only looks at the protein-based sensitivity. So it might say you're fine on grains, but you know yourself that you don't do well if you eat those a lot. For example, grains aren't that big a deal to me, but nightshades are. So I can't overdo nightshades. Can I have tomatoes at a meal? No problem. Could I have potatoes at one meal? No problem. What if I would eat uh, regular white potatoes with the skins for three days in a row? Well, I start to get a little pain uh, right around my thumb joint where it meets my wrist. So what do I do? Well, I know that now, and I go easy on nightshades. Every once in a while, I want a nice heirloom tomato in season. Fantastic. That's exactly what I do. Go out to a restaurant, and they don't have sweet potatoes. They don't have whatever else, Japanese yams that I might like. Then I'll eat some regular potato. And I'll be fine. I just won't do that again multiple days in a row. So we kind of have to respect our bioindividuality a bit while also repairing our gut. And and again, we can get well, but it's like anybody. Everybody's going to have a couple things that aren't the best for their body. That's where the bioindividuality comes in. Okay. Anton's up next. Is this our second Anton? No, I answered one yesterday from Anton. All right. We've got another one from Anton. Uh, And he is saying... Hi, Dr. Rawl. I'm a longtime listener and follower of yours. I have listened to all of your podcasts. I'm an IHP student, and I also use the search page on your podcast website. Couldn't find the answer. Does in which way you cook your food affect nutrition values and digestion? Take a potato, for example. What's the difference between steamed, grilled in an oven, or cooked in water potato? Keep up the great work. You're the goat. (laughs) Hope you know what that means. It's a compliment. Uh, thanks, Anton. I, I know what the I know what a goat is. Tom Brady of the New England Patriots, now Tampa Bay Bucks, is the goat, right? So I know what the goat is. Uh, but all kidding aside, he, here's here's the answer that I want to give you. I did a podcast, and I want you to check this out. And it's it's already out on the difference between fresh, frozen, meaning like fresh raw, frozen, and cooked vegetables. Okay. Check that out. Go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Type in fresh, frozen, cooked. All right? You should be able to find the podcast. If you can't, ask the question at cabralsupportgroup.com and uh, Michelle or one of the great people in our group will direct you 
to that podcast, all right? But let me just share with you this. You're asking about steamed, grilled, um, oven, or cooked in water. There's not gonna be a huge difference between cooked. I'm really talking about raw, frozen, like fresh, frozen, and cooked, all right? So there's a little bit of a difference. Um, if you're talking about cooking in water, you can lose some of those nutrients into the water, so that's a possibility. The only other big difference between your cooking is high heat is typically never ideal for cooking food, especially since there can create more acrylamides on your food. High heat can create more charring, charcoal, acrylamides, uh, which creates what's called advanced glycation end products in the body and oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species. You don't want that. It's gonna make you age faster, create more inflammation. All right, good question. Uh, Anton's, Anton is up again. Hi, Dr. Rawl. Last question for today. I have a history of concussions, and for me, cranial sacral therapy uh, work by an osteopath has been terrific for changing my fight and flight into calmness and peacefulness. I couldn't find that you talked about it before. Would love to hear your opinion about it. I would, will continue to do it no matter what you say about it though. Thanks again, you're the goat. Okay, <laughs> thanks Anton. Uh, love, I mean, the goat's great, fantastic. So, um, okay, so I love cranial sacral therapy and I've definitely talked about it before and I've talked about it inside of IHP. Cranial sac sacral therapy is a great add-on to a massage. If you have the opportunity to get a 60 minute massage plus 30 minutes of cranial sacral work, oh, it's fantastic. You can often feel the wave of cerebral spinal fluid move down your spine. You can almost, if a good practitioner, you kind of feel that energy uh, and they can make you almost feel weightless, which helps to then, just like Anton said, turn off the fight or flight and help with that state of uh, what's called the parasympathetic nervous system, the PNS. Something else, uh, Anton, that you might want to look into that could also be highly beneficial for you with that state of weightlessness is float tank therapy. And I've talked about that on a previous podcast as well. Cranial sacral therapy. I can't believe you weren't able to find that um, on the search. I have to go search for that right now. I find it so hard to believe. Let's see if we can find that right now at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts. And inside of the search bar, I just want you to type in craniosacral. That's plenty. That's that's for sure you should be able to find it. So craniosacral, and uh, we'll see if what pops up. You're right. It did not pop up. Craniosacral. Hard to believe that it didn't pop up. Hmm. All right. But it didn't. So you're right. So yes, I approve. I think cranial sacral therapy is fantastic, and it's a great add-on uh, to calming that fight or flight-based process. Really happy to hear that you're working with a qualified osteopath uh, with that. Okay, well, good. Still lots of time. Mo's up next. Hi, Dr. Sproul. It's Mo again. I know Mo. Happy to happy to see you again here today on the house calls. And again, thank you for all the comments on social media as well. People think that I don't read them. I read them. I can't respond to every single comment but I absolutely read all of your YouTube comments, your Instagram comments for sure. All right, uh, Mo says, today I'm reaching out in regards to my daughter. She's three years old and I want some advice on a children's multivitamin, probiotic and omega-3. Let's see, uh, I do a small amount of the omega supplement from Equal, Equal, uh, Equal Life and also give her the children's probiotic. Is this okay for her? Please uh, recommend anything that you think that she needs. I wish uh, Equal Life had more children products, hopefully soon. As always, thank you for your time, efforts, advice, knowledge, and everything you do for the world. Uh, P.S. Some morning she sits with me, watches your new videos. Cheers, Mo. Thanks, Mo. Appreciate that. Happy to hear um, you and your daughter are doing well. Well, she's three years old, so she's actually getting right to the point where she could do a little bit of the daily nutritional support, a little bit of the daily fruit and vegetable blend, a little bit of the omega-3 liquid, um, and a little bit of the, like a, a, a quarter of a cap of the daily probiotic support. So the thing is like, when we created our daily foundational protocols, we didn't really do it for necessarily adults or children, like it's what humans need. But for children, the dose is based on 150 pound adult. Now, if you're 110 pounds, 120 pounds as an adult, you still take the 150 pound dosage, right? You still take the 100%. There's no doubt about that. But for a child below the age of, let's say, 16 years old, 
14 to 16 years old, depends on maturation of the child, you want to do about the child's weight divided into 150. So um, let's just say your, your three-year-old weighs uh, 40 pounds, probably not 40 pounds. Let's say they weigh 30 pounds. So let's do some math on that. Uh, 30 pounds uh, divided by 150 is five, right? So that equals what, 20%? So you would use 20% of the serving. That's about 25% of the serving, just a little bit less. So you're welcome to do that. She certainly doesn't even need that much at three years old, especially if she's eating a good, healthy diet. You're welcome to use a gummy if your child prefers a gummy um, instead for a you know multivitamin. Just make sure that it, there's no food dyes in it. Um, children can also use the uh, children's liquid vitamin D at about 35 IUs per pound of body weight. That's over at equa.life. What else? The omega-3, they can do a quarter of a teaspoon of the omega-3, um, or they can just eat fish. Like again, if, you, if they're good eaters and you're serving them fish. So I don't think that we need to overdo it with children's vitamins, uh, but my kids use the daily nutritional support, the omega-3, uh, we put in the daily probiotic, and uh, they're using zinc right now, they're using vitamin C right now, but we use the child life vitamin C right now, and they use the vitamin D. And now that they're six and eight, they just get one drop of the adult vitamin C, which is the 1,000 I use. So uh, Mo, hopefully that was helpful. I don't think that you should overdo it with children's vitamins, uh, but of course they need a little support, just like all of us. All right, let's see. Next up is Anonymous, and Anonymous says, Hi, Dr. Brawl. I'm a male in my mid-20s. I know I have gut issues and candida overgrowth. I've ordered the CBO protocol and the CBO finisher. I will start it soon. I don't diagnose myself. It's not allowed on the Cabral concept, but I have literally zero sex drive. My scrotum is literally hanging down and feels like I weigh or feels like I'm 100 years old. Could candida overgrowth cause this situation, or are there other things I should rebalance in my body? This has been hard emotionally for me because I've had this issue for many years. It's not that fun to have no interest in dating when you're in your 20s, but I try to stay positive. One day it will get better. Thanks, Stephen. You are my hero. Anonymous, happy to help with this. I understand, obviously, a sensitive issue, uh, but you deserve a good, solid answer. So here's what I want to share with you is this, is that... Yes, candida can absolutely play a part in this, but let me share with you why. It can be more of an issue of leaky gut or intestinal permeability where your body for so many years has been allowing bacteria and proteins from the food that you eat to spill into your bloodstream. And that then is causing systemic inflammation. And it's really been wearing your body down and causing you to become inflamed. And as you're inflamed, it's really fatiguing and exhausting your body because your immune system is always on. Now, that's just one explanation. I do hope that you read the rain barrel effect, but it's my opinion that we need to get you on a good foundational protocol. So I love that you're doing the CBO protocol. And what I would also love you to do is the daily foundational protocol level three. And I would also love you to do uh, one scoop of the alkalizing vitamin C upon waking, uh, four drops of the vitamin D, and uh, the zinc picolinate at 25 uh, milligrams. Now, would I like you to run at least the starter kit first? And the answer is yes. I mean, with 100%. But you're doing the CBO protocol, so it's going to be tough to run that candida metabolic and vitamins test right now. So I prefer you just to run the uh, stress hormones, mood and metabolism test to look at your testosterone levels to see if there's really something off before starting all of your supplements. It's okay to do the CBO, but I'd love to see it before starting the other supplements because I know we're going to be able to make improvements. And I'd also like you to run the hair tissue mineral analysis called a complete minerals and metals test. The reason being, I just want to see if there's heavy metals in the body too. There's a lot that you could be going through. Uh, I'd also love you to join the integrative health practitioner uh, program. So you start to learn more about your body because I know that I'm not going to be able to answer this in a couple minutes, but I really want to be able to help. And uh, Anonymous, that's because I know there's an answer to your question. I really do. I've worked with many men in your position, and I just don't want this to be your life. And I know that we'll be able to help you uh, boost those natural hormones, help heal the gut, help balance healthy levels of inflammation. And you're so young that you're going to be able to do this because your body still has a lot of vitality to it. So hopefully that was helpful. And uh, let's keep moving forward, right? Let's keep moving forward. All right. 
Well, it looks like that is our time for today. The time always flies by, at least for me. Thank you so much for tuning into another Cabral House Call. I truly appreciate you. I really do. Of course, if this house call was helpful, if any of the podcasts are helpful, please feel free to share them with anyone you believe they could serve. And don't forget, every single Monday is a Mindset and Motivation Monday where we inspire each one of us to be better, to do more, to move forward in our life. Stay tuned. Coming up tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Have an amazing rest of the weekend.